Mr. Dreeben, do you oh. really — I mean, the presidents have to make a lot of tough decisions about enforcing the law, and they have to make decisions about questions that are unsettled, and they have to make decisions based on the information that's available. Do you really did, — did I understand you to say, well, you know, if he makes a mistake, he makes a mistake. He's subject to the criminal laws just like anybody else. You don't well, think I, he's in a special — a, a peculiarly precarious position? He's in a special position for a number of reasons. One is that he has access to legal advice about everything that he does. He's under a constitutional obligation to — he's supposed to be faithful to the laws of the United States and the Constitution of the United States. And making a mistake is not what lands you in a criminal prosecution. There's been some talk about the statutes that are issue in this case. I think they are fairly described as malum in se statutes, uh, engaging in conspiracies to defraud the United States with respect to one of the most important functions, namely the certification of the next president. Well, I, I don't want to dispute the particular application of, of that, of 371, conspiracy to defraud the United States to the particular facts here. But would you not agree that that is a peculiarly open-ended statutory prohibition in that that fraud under that provision unlike under most other fraud provisions does not have to do doesn't require uh, any uh, uh, in, impairment of a property interest it's in the, designed to protect the functions of the United States government and it's difficult to think of a more critical function than the certification of who won the election yeah you know, I'm not, as I said I'm not discussing the particular facts of this case but it applies to any uh, fraud that interferes seriously with any government operation, right? So what the government needs to show is an intent to impede, interfere, or defeat a lawful government function by deception, and it has to be done with scienter. These are not the kinds of activities that I think any of us would think a president needs to engage in in order to fulfill his Article II duties, and particularly in a case like this one. I, I want to pick up on something that the court said earlier about the distinction between a public official acting to achieve public ends and a public official acting to achieve private ends. As applied to this case, the president has no functions with respect to the certification of the winner of the presidential election. It seems likely that the framers designed the Constitution that way because at the time of the founding, presidents had no two-term limit. They could run again and again, and uh, uh, were expected potentially to want to do that. So the potential for self-interest would explain why the states pr conduct the elections. They send uh, electors to uh, certify who won those elections and to provide votes. And then Congress, in a joint, extraordinary joint session, certifies the vote. And the president doesn't have an official role in that proceeding. So it's difficult for me to understand how there could be a serious constitutional question about saying, you can't use fraud to defeat that function. You can't obstruct it through deception. You can't deprive millions of voters of their right to have their vote counted for the candidate who they chose. Thank and you, counsel. Uh, Justice Thomas? Justice Alito? Could we just briefly review the layers of protection that you think exists? And I'm going to start with what the D.C. Circuit said. So the first layer of protection is that attorneys general and other Justice Department attorneys can be trusted to act in a professional and ethical manner, right? Yes. Uh, how uh, robust is that protection? I mean, most of the, the vast majority of attorneys general and Justice Department of attorneys, and we both served in the Justice Department for a long time, are honorable people and they take their professional ethical responsibilities seriously. But there had been exceptions, right, both among attorneys general and among federal prosecutors. There have been rare exceptions, Justice Alito, but when we're talking about layers of protection, I do think this is the, the starting point. And if the court has concerns about the robustness of it, 
I, I would suggest looking at the charges in this case. They, um, well, I want to talk about this in, in the abstract, because w what is before us, of course, does involve this particular case, which is immensely important. But whatever we decide is going to apply to all future presidents. So as for attorneys general, there have been two who were convicted of criminal offenses while in office. There were others, uh, a Mitchell Palmer's one that comes to mind, who is widely regarded as having abused the power of his office. Would you agree with that? I would, but they are two officials in a long line of attorneys generals who did not, and in departments of justice that are staffed by multiple people who do adhere to their office. And Justice Alito, if I could just, the point that I wanted to make about this case does go to the general proposition. The allegations about the misuse of the Department of Justice to perpetuate uh, election fraud show exactly how the Department of Justice functions in the way that it is supposed to. Petitioner is alleged to have tried to get the Department of Justice to send fraudulent letters to the states to get them to reverse electoral results. Yeah, the Department I, I, of I, understand, I, understand, I understand that, Mr. Dreeben, but as I said, this case will have effects that go far beyond this particular prosecution. So moving on to the second level, Mm -hmm. of protection that the D.C. Circuit cited. Federal grand juries will shield former presidents from unwarranted indictments. How much protection is that? Well, it, it affords two levels of protection. One is the, the probable cause finding requires evidence. I think some of the fears about groundless prosecutions aren't supported by evidence, and they're not going to get out of the starting game. I mean, there, there's the old saw about indicting a ham sandwich um, Yes, but I think uh, Justice I mean, you, ex you had a lot of experience in the Justice Department. You come across a lot of cases where uh, the, the, the U.S. attorney or another federal prosecutor really wanted to indict a case and the grand jury refused to do so. There are such cases. Yeah, there, I, yeah. Yes. Uh, but I think that the other Every level once in a while there's an eclipse, too. Uh, <laughs> well, I think that that's for the most reason is prosecutors have no incentive to bring a case to a grand jury and secure an indictment when they don't have evidence to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. It's self-defeating. All right. Then the third level is that former presidents enjoy all the protections afforded all criminal defendants, right? And we've discussed that. And that may be true at the end of the day, but a mm -hmm. lot can happen between the time when an indictment is returned and the time when the former president finally gets a vindication, perhaps on appeal. Isn't that correct? It is correct, Justice Alito, but I think that we should also consider the history of this country. As members of the court have observed, it's baked into the Constitution that any president knows that they are exposed to potential criminal prosecution. My friend says after impeachment and conviction, we don't read the impeachment judgment clause that way, but we are, it's common ground that all former presidents have known that they could be indicted and convicted. And Watergate cemented that understanding. Uh, the Watergate smoking gun tape involved President Nixon and H.R. Haldeman talking about and then deciding to use the CIA to give a bogus story to the FBI to shut down a criminal investigation. I mean, Mr. Sauer and others have identified events in the past where presidents have engaged in conduct that might have been charged as a federal crime. And you, you say, well, no, that's not really true. This is page 42 of your brief. So what about President Franklin D. Roosevelt's decision to intern Japanese Americans during World War II. Couldn't that have been charged under uh, 18 U.S.C. 241, conspiracy against civil rights? Today, yes, given this court's decision in Trump versus United States, in which uh, the, the, you know, Trump versus Hawaii, excuse me, where the court said Korematsu is overruled. I mean, President Roosevelt made that decision with the advice of his attorney general. That's a layer is of Is that safeguard. really true? I thought, pre I thought Attorney General Biddle thought that uh, there was really no threat of sabotage, as did J. Edgar Hoover. So I think that there is a lot of historical controversy, but it underscores that that occurred during wartime. It implicates a potential commander-in-chief 
concerns, concerns about the exigencies of national defense that might provide an as-applied Article II challenge at the time. I'm not suggesting today. But the idea that uh, a decision that was made and ultimately endorsed by this court, perhaps wrongly, in the Korematsu case would support criminal prosecution under 241, which requires under United States versus Lanier that the right have been made specific so that there is notice to the president. I don't think that would have been satisfied. All right. Well, we could go through other historical examples. I won't do that. Let me just touch briefly on a couple of other things. One is the relevance of advice of counsel, and I wasn't clear what your answer is. So if the president gets advice from the attorney general that something is lawful, is that an absolute defense? Yes, uh, I think that it is um, under the principle of entrapment by estoppel. This is a due process doctrine that we referred to in our brief, uh, our reply brief in Garland versus Cargill this term at page 19, where we cited authority of this court that if a authorized government representative tells you that what you are about to do is lawful, it would be a, a root violation of due process to prosecute you for that. Will that won't that give presidents an incentive to be sure to pick an attorney general who can will, will who will reliably tell the president that it is lawful to do whatever the president wants to do if there's any possibly conceivable argument in favor of it? So I think the constitutional structure protects against that risk. The president nominates the attorney general and the Senate provides advice and consent. And these are the sort of structural checks that have operated for 200 years to prevent the kind of abuses that my friend fears going forward as a result of this once in history prosecution. Uh, on the question of whether a president has the authority to pardon himself, which came up earlier mm -hmm. in the argument, what's the answer to that question? I don't believe the Department of Justice has taken a position. The, the only authority that I'm aware of is a member of the Office of Legal Counsel wrote on a memorandum that there is no self-pardon authority. As far as I know, the department has not addressed it further. And of course, this court had not. Uh, addressed it either. Well, when you addressed that question before us, are you speaking in your capacity solely as a member of the special counsel's team, or, or are you speaking uh, on behalf of the Justice Department, which has special institutional responsibilities? I am speaking on behalf of the Justice Department, representing the United States. Now, how don't you think we need to know the answer to at least to the Justice Department's position on that issue in order to decide this case? Because if a president has the authority to pardon himself before leaving office and the D.C. Circuit is right that there is no immunity from prosecution, won't the, the predictable result be that presidents on the last couple of days of office are going to pardon themselves from anything that they might have been conceivably charged with committing? I, I really doubt that, Justice Alito. I mean, it sort of presupposes a regime that we have never had except for President Nixon and as alleged in the indictment here. Presidents who are conscious of having engaged in wrongdoing and seeking to shield themselves. I think the political consequences of a president who uh, asserted a right of self-pardon that has never been recognized that seems to contradict a bedrock principle of our law that no person shall be the judge in their own case. Uh, those are adequate deterrents, I think, so that this kind of dystopian regime is not going to evolve. All right, let me end, end with just a question about what is required for the functioning of a stable democratic society, which is something that we all want. Um, I'm sure you would agree with me that a stable democratic society requires that a candidate who loses an election, even a close one, even a hotly contested one, leave office peacefully if that candidate is, is the incumbent. Of course. All right. Now, if a, an incumbent who loses a very close, hotly contested election knows that a real possibility uh, after leaving office is not that the president is going to be able to go off into a peaceful retirement, but that the president may be criminally prosecuted by a bitter political opponent, will that not lead us into 
a cycle that destabilizes the functioning of our country as a democracy. And we can look around the world and find countries where we have seen this process, where the loser gets thrown in jail. So I think it's exactly the opposite, Justice Alito. There are lawful mechanisms to contest the results in an election. And outside the record, but I think of public knowledge, a uh, petitioner and his allies filed dozens of electoral challenges, and in my understanding is lost all but one that was not outcome determinative in any respect. There were judges that, that said in order to sustain substantial claims of fraud that would overturn an election result that's certified by a state, you need evidence, you need proof. And none of those things were manifested. So there is an appropriate way to challenge things through the courts with evidence. If you lose, you accept the results. That has been the nation's experience. I think the court is well familiar right. with that. Thank you. Justice so 